Hi. Hello, all right. Welcome to track two. I see someone who has been here for three sessions straight, so nice to see some true track tours. I'd also like to say a thank you to our gold sponsors and our uh, silver sponsors, uh, Pure Jingles, Radio Analyzer, Radio Intelligence, Stream Monkey, Triton Digital, and XPLR Media. XPLR is also hosting tonight's party at the Blitz Club. You can check it out in the Swap Card app. Now I will leave the floor to Mariana Spring and Sam Bonham. Hey, thanks for having me. How's everyone doing? That sounds a little bit sleepy. How's everyone doing? <laughs> hey, it's radio days. Um, welcome to this session all about disinformation. My name's Sam Bonham. I am a podcast editor at BBC News, and I work a lot with Mariana Spring on her various podcasts. Um, this is like a topic that so many people at Radio Days are interested in. Disinformation, fake news, online abuse. And, um, you know, I think we're going to have a conversation for about 40 minutes. We're going to cover those topics. We're going to talk about elections. Um, I'd love for you guys to jump in, stick your hands up, ask questions. We're just going to do it throughout, and I'll come to you um, as, as we're going, because I think it's really important to kind of hear what you guys are after and what you guys are thinking in your own organizations. Um, shall we start? Hey. Hello. Um, shall we just start with like you as a thing that exists in <laughs> in the world? You are the BBC's first social media and disinformation correspondent. I am. I don't think I'll ever quite get used to sitting in front of large photos of myself behind me, which is always a bit bizarre. Uh, I am, yeah, so I'm the first ever disinformation and social media correspondent at the BBC, um, which is a very long title and essentially means I spend most of my time investigating everything bad on social media, whether it's disinformation, whether it's algorithms and polarization, trolling, hate. Um, and I really focus on the real world consequences and the impact that this kind of content can have on social media, but it often bleeds into all kinds of other mediums as well. Um, and the journalism I do exists in lots of different forms across the BBC. So I um, have done quite a lot of work for BBC Panorama, which is one of our flagship investigative brands, um, documentaries. Um, I work across BBC News for the website, um, for the News at 10, uh, various linear programs that exist at the BBC. And uh, one of the main things I've been doing over the past few years is these podcasts, which are for BBC Radio 4. You'll tell there are lots of different brands at the BBC, yeah. <laughs> which I'm now reeling off. Um, and uh, they exist on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcasts. And for me, they've been a really brilliant way of investigating this social media world and really bringing it to life. So I like to actually be out there meeting people, understanding what's going on, not just kind of sitting behind a computer fact checking stuff. So, so you mentioned a few brands. Um, where do you sit within the BBC? I mean, even I'm a little bit confused sometimes with exactly where you sit. Like, there's kind of BBC News, there's BBC Radio 4, there's BBC Verify. Do you want to just explain a little bit as kind of like where you sit within the organization and kind of like structurally? Yeah, so the BBC uh, is very big and <laughs> it has also uh, launched quite recently a new team called BBC Verify. So BBC Verify um, brings together a whole range of different resources at the BBC people who specialize in fact-checking, in open source investigative techniques, OSINT, um, in analysis more generally, data, um, different skills like that. And then in my case, kind of investigating disinformation and social media. So we all exist within this new team, um, which is a home of this expertise. But actually the journalism I do is almost always uh, cross-platform. It's for every single different type of audience. And I think that's so, so important because um, I tend to find that it really appeals to younger audiences and underserved audiences on social media, online, but it also appeals to traditional audiences who um, uh, the BBC continues to kind of reach often more so through its linear output. Um, and uh, I, I think in some ways I'm sort of a bit like a new model for a BBC reporter or correspondent, which is that the original journalism you do um, is, is packaged up in different ways, in different vessels, so to speak, and then reaches a whole range of, of new and different audiences. And I'm really passionate about that. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Um, w w you know, you talk about your investigation. What is the kind of the disinformation challenge as you see it? Like what is the thing that you are kind of tackling and covering? So um, 
I mean, a lot of people talk about disinformation a lot. Um, it's become a bit of a buzzword in some ways. And I think that for me, certainly, what I deal in is the most extreme disinformation. So where something is lauded, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where something is, um, you know, called a hoax or staged or that it's never really happened at all. So I've spent a lot of time, obviously, during the pandemic, there were various conspiracy theories suggesting that stuff that uh, you know, that the pandemic was staged in some way. It was part of an elaborate plot to kill lots of people. Um, and, uh, you know, the same for different wars, the same for terror attacks that have happened in different places all over the world. Um, and so, so I guess for me, I think there's a kind of difference between, and, and I talk about this quite a lot, but legitimate concerns and questions people have, and then these extreme conspiracy theories. And the reason why I often deal in those is because I think they're the most powerful way of revealing to audiences um, the harm this can cause, the impact it has, the threat it poses either to you as an individual, to society, or to um, the people who are caught up in this, who find themselves at the center of social media frenzies or these kinds of conspiracy theories. Um, so I think that, a lot of us like to think that we are immune to conspiracy theories, disinformation. I think a lot of people in this room, we'd hope, would think that because a lot of people here are journalists. Um, but actually, I think we can all be quite vulnerable and susceptible to it. And m I see my job very much as exposing how this all works so that we can all be more aware of, of, of the tactics used, the way we're targeted, the harm it can cause, and ultimately why it matters. Because I think, and I said this this morning, but fact-checking on its own is just not enough. I think that fact-checking on the whole uh, super serves an audience who already um, kind of uh, are seeking out fact-checking. Actually, you want to be reaching new audiences who perhaps are encountering this kinds of stuff on their social media feeds or in their day-to-day -day life, but they're not necessarily aware of the tactics that are targeting them or how they're being misled or the harm that it could cause. Um, so the disinformation problem, um, I think it exists on all kinds of different levels. There's kind of simple mistruths that are quite easy to debunk, and then there's the more extreme conspiracy theories. Throw into that AI technology, other forms of technology that can be abused used, misused. I talked about AI-generated AI audio this morning as well um, as something I'm really concerned about the way that could be used in this massive election year. Um, it's a really big job and that's, you know, and, and I guess as well, it's not just about the disinformation problem, right? It doesn't exist mm. in isolation. Disinformation is very much tied in with hate on social media. It's often a tool that's deployed by, I like to call them the kind of shock troops, but the people who are pushing these kinds of narratives, disinformation, conspiracy theories, they use hate as a, as a weapon, as a part of a part of that. I frequently find myself on the receiving end, as do um, a lot of the people whose stories I investigate. And then you've also got the, the issues of kind of polarization and algorithms, which again contribute massively to the disinformation problem, because this is all about our existing biases, entrenching our existing biases, and leaving us vulnerable to perhaps extreme ideas or harmful content in a way we might not have been were our, fe were our feeds not curated in that way. You just used the word harm, I think, six or seven times. And we talk a lot about like real world harm, right, as being a kind of critical part of disinformation and what you're doing. How do you decide what to investigate? So for me, there are two tests. Um, and uh, one of these sort of lines has to be passed for me to investigate or cover a story. The first is that it's sufficiently viral, it's reaching enough people that it merits our attention and actually it's often reaching more people even than we can um, and that's certainly the case on social media quite a lot of the time. Um, the second test, which um, is the one perhaps I use m even more frequently, is this real-world harm question. Are there real people who are being harmed by this, being attacked, being targeted? Um, and who ultimately also feel like no one is investigating and exposing what's going on. I hear from people all the time, particularly sending me direct messages, getting in touch, who say, I've reported this to the social media companies, nothing has happened. I've reached out to the authorities, nothing has happened. I've reached out to politicians, nothing has happened. I don't know what to do. And I think there's increasingly um, a whole range of people who are being harmed and affected by what's unfolding on social media. And I very much see it as my job as a public service journalist to be investigating their stories and exposing what's happening, because otherwise I, I don't think anyone would be. And I went to your book launch a couple of weeks ago, and there were literally like people that you've looked, talked to and who have been trolled or have had online abuse that were there 
all, you know, and it's kind of this quite powerful, arresting moment actually to see them in that kind of environment. And they're, how do they feel? Yeah, and, and the people we're talking about here are um, survivors of terror attacks who were told that they faked their injuries, that these attacks were staged in some way. Um, families who've, who've had their children killed, murdered, um, and social media has played a part in what's happened. So these are people who've lived through some of the very worst things, and then on top of that have had to deal with conspiracy theories, hate, abuse. Um, and it was really emotional, kind of. Uh, for me, one of the most important things about this job is really being able to investigate people's stories and meet them and to build that relationship of trust with them as much as you do with the audience and to really care about them. Um, and so to have them there, a good plug for my book, which is out now, Among the Trolls, <laughs> um, which you can get wherever you get your books, um, but to have them there and for them to feel um, that that my journalism had served an important purpose for them, I think is, is really crucial. And, and those are the two people that matter most, I think, when we're talking about this, the people who are trusting you to investigate their stories. And I'm not just talking about the victims, the people that are harmed, but actually also sometimes the people who are brave enough to allow you to ask them questions or to hold them to account or who have become caught up in this conspiracy land, as I talk about a lot. You know, I'm grateful to them as well for trusting me to, to to look into what's happened to them and, and to, to understand what's unfolded. That's the, the most important people, but as well as that, it's the audience. And those, I think, are in all of the reporting I do at the forefront of, that they're the, the two bits that really matter. Let's talk about uh, one of the people that you've held to account, Darren. Uh, we worked together on this podcast series, Mariana in Conspiracy Land. Tell us a little bit about, about that. Yes, I feel like there's as interesting a, uh, of a story about this image as there is about <laughs> the podcast. For this picture, I had to I had to crawl into a muddy hole, like an actual muddy hole, and like pose like this. And it was the most difficult. Felt like doing a Pilates class <laughs> for about three yeah. hours. Um, uh, so the podcast series is all about um, investigating the conspiracy theory movement, particularly in the UK, that has continued to um, ha has become perhaps. It's intensified since the pandemic in a way that maybe we didn't anticipate. Um, and the ever committed members of this conspiracy theory movement continue to protest the hate and the violent rhetoric that's tied into that, the disinformation they're promoting, and the way that that's dividing and harming communities and individuals. And so I start in this town called Totnes, which is in the southwest of um, the UK. Um, and I go out and meet a whole variety of different people there who are caught up in this movement, who've been harmed. Um, and they kind of put me on the trail of this conspiracy theory newspaper. And today, a lot of people are talking about AI ch technology, which is absolutely something important for us to be talking about, particularly in terms of the risks and the harms from a disinformation point of view. But still now, simple memes or even a conspiracy theory newspaper can be just as effective at spreading disinformation. Um, so you don't necessarily need all of the kind of snazzy tools to be able to do this kind of stuff. And the editor of this conspiracy theory newspaper is a man called Darren Nesbitt, and he agreed to do an interview with me, only if he could also interview me in the process. So I, we I mean, this is a classic thing that you've had you know, a few times now. Yeah, so often people will say, right, well, I'll only do an interview with you if you'll answer questions, which I'm more than happy to answer questions about my journalism and what I do. And so we agreed, and it was this kind of four-hour back-and-forth interview with this newspaper editor um, where... He was asking me questions, I was asking him questions. And actually, there was one point in the interview where I sort of had to stop and say, Darren, it's really hard to do this interview because, like, Sam, you and I can be sitting here and looking at, I don't know, that bottle of water on the ground. I might love the bottle of water, you might hate the bottle of water, but we agree the bottle of water is there. It's definitely there. When you're having a conversation where the other person doesn't think the bottle of water is there, it becomes very, very difficult to talk about anything. Um, and that was certainly the case in this interview. And I think you've got a clip of it. Let's play a clip. The paper's been criticised for links to figures who are considered um, far-right figures or anti-Semitic figures. What's your relationship with these groups? Um, I don't have any relationship with them. Why do you allow them in your paper? Um, because if they write good articles uh, on topics that are, um, you know, useful, topics that are interesting to people, then we should have them. Do, do you worry that by defending those individuals or giving them a platform, you are effectively condoning these kinds of views for your readership or at, at the very least advertising these kinds of characters and views to your readership? Well, we, we de definitely hold our readership in a higher regard um, than the BBC holds its viewers because we... Um, 
credit them with the ability to um, make the same kind of decisions on each piece of information as we go along. How do you, uh, do, do, as, a, as an editor, do you yeah. feel responsible for what you put? Because I, I do think that there's a certain amount of editorial responsibility that we all talk about. How do we make sure that we are um, uh, giving our readership accurate and fair information, but also that we are not promoting hate or hateful ideas well, or anti-Semitism? We don't hateful ideas. But, but you, you have. No, we so what about someone like Graham Hart? Um, so the paper directly defended Graham Hart. Um, he was sentenced to 32 months in prison for making anti-Semitic um, remarks on his radio show. And in the article about him, there was no mention of those comments. It was suggested that it was just a conversation. But he said things like, Jews are filth, they're like rats, and they deserve to be wiped out. Yeah, that's pretty harsh stuff. Yeah, well, why defend someone like that? We didn't. We you defended his right to say it. But you think it's right for him to say, to, for him to spread hate like that, and you think it's right to condone the spreading of hate in that way? Again, people should be adults and make their own decision. We believe in the right of people to hold ideas, hold thoughts, ideas, and and and, and express their views. Um, if we don't have that, if you take that away in one, you know, if you take one iota from that away, um, we're we're now down the road of of, of censorship, of thought control. Do you think that? calls for action in the paper, for people to take action right. to do something, could result in action that is not peaceful. Of course. I mean, you know, people make their own decisions and they need to be responsible for their own actions. Interesting. So, so you've, you've met quite a few um, uh, people like Darren. Yeah. Um, like, just, just unpack a little bit, like, what's he like? What are people like in his, like, similar people to him, what are they like? What, like, what's their justification for... Uh, for, for kind of publishing and doing, putting out there some of the things that they put out there. One of the most telling things about that interview, which was uh, part of the Conspiracy Land podcast, but we also visualised it for, for iPlayer um, in, uh, at the BBC. Uh, one of the most interesting things was afterwards. So we finished this interview and it had been like four hours and everyone was kind of quite, quite polite at the end. It was like, thank you for your time, thank you for your time. It was all very, very British. Oh, goodbye, bye. And then afterwards, um, uh, I get home and I think, it was the I think it was the next day, he's posted this like picture of me and a poem and it's like, Marina Spring is evil and she shills for cash and all these kinds of lingo and terms that you learn when you inhabit conspiracy land like I do. And for me, that kind of summed it all up, which is he has a goal, which is to court his online followers, to grow them, to grow the readers of his conspiracy theory paper. He felt powerful. He felt important. He had a certain, he felt like he had a certain kind of agency and control, perhaps that he didn't before. He genuinely, I think, had convinced himself of some of these ideas and conspiracy theories. Um, and, that, you know, the truth didn't matter. It didn't matter that I'd been polite to him and they'd not, you know, that th th his post was no reflection of our conversation. Um, it, it just sort of, it's the way that they distort reality right in front of your eyes. And so I think for these kinds of people, holding them to account is important. They're not the most powerful or the richest conspiracy theorists, but they're people who have caused and can cause serious harm with the content they're sharing, posting, publishing. Um, and I think they're driven principally by the kind of power and reach that affords, even just within a kind of committed minority of followers. Great. As I said, we're going to try and get to as many questions as we can. I think we've had one. If you could introduce yourself and say where you're from, that'd be great. I'm uh, RTL, um, I'm a Chief Revenue Officer, so my question is a little bit sales related. How is this newspaper funded? Is it ad funded? And if it's ad funded, have you spoken to uh, some of the, of, of the companies who are doing ads in this, com in this uh, newspaper? That's a really good question. Um, so it's essentially funded, or the investigation found, from, from speaking to kind of a whole range of different people, it's funded by these hubs of supporters. So it's like a subscription-based model where people are paying to order in these newspapers and then they hand them out on the high streets in the town. There are advertisers, and I've tracked down quite a few of them. They tend to advertise this almost al whole alternative life. So um, holidays for conspiracy theorists, like the restaurants for conspiracy theorists, um, different, different, it's a whole, it's, it, that's kind of why we called it conspiracy land. It's like this whole kind of other world that you can enter. Um, and one of the advertisers, I, I spoke to him on the phone and kind of grilled him on various issues and the content in the paper and was he happy for his adverts to be alongside it? 
And the conversation ended with him saying that he basically thought I should be hanged for crimes against humanity because he genuinely thinks that I'm part of some kind of sinister plot to kill and harm everyone. And so I think, you know, it, it's, it's like once you've entered that conspiracy land, they can kind of all function within their own ecosystem and that's what funds and drives it. There are still questions about other people who would have an interest in supporting a conspiracy theory newspaper like this. I've not found any links to kind of especially suspicious large donors. I do think it's a committed following that fund it. But I think, again, that tells us why this kind of conspiracy theory economy is able to thrive, because it relies, a bit like the media in some areas, on subscriptions, on devoted followers. You don't need millions of people. You just need, like, several thousand people who are willing to pay, you know, £20 a month, which is what these, what these people are doing. Yeah. And um, so we've talked about Mariana in Conspiracy Land. Let's now talk about this other podcast series that we've worked on, Why Do You Hate Me? Um, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, another large photo. Another of big photo behind. of you. Um, so, why do you hate me? Um, uh, is very much about investigating um, the world of social media, particularly the kind of hate that um, that exists on it, um, and um, understanding why people behave the way they do online. Um, and the the starting point, I guess, is that I receive a lot of hate and abuse for the journalism that I do. Um, uh, the numbers between sort of January and June of last year showed that I was receiving 80% of the abuse and hate directed at BBC um, on-air or high-profile journalists, um, and that can take the thought form of threats, abuse, doxing, all kinds of stuff. Um, Sam is very well acquainted with my <laughs> hate and threats that I experienced. And so I really wanted to kind of start with that question of, why is this happening? Why am I receiving this hate? Why are all kinds of people receiving this hate? Because I'm really fortunate I don't receive racist, homophobic, other kinds of abuse. Um, I'm, it, you know, I'm, I have the BBC and other people that support me, um, but lots of people don't have that. And I receive thousands of messages all the time from people saying, please, can you investigate this? I've been targeted in this way, what's going on? And so this series, I investigated five different extraordinary cases of online hate. The first of which was a woman who regretted posting online that she was Madeleine McCann. She was based in Poland and she wasn't Madeleine McCann, but she went incredibly viral for saying she was and became a lightning rod for all kinds of hate and triggered hate herself. The second episode was a man who survived a mass shooting and genuinely believed the conspiracy theories about it. The third was about an AI-generated clip of the mayor of London, which um, fanned the flames of unrest um, around uh, the pro-Palestinian protests and Armistice Day. And that was one of these audio clips that you were talking yeah, about Yeah, it was a fake audio today. clip. Sounded like it was a secret recording, was very convincing, and spread like wildfire in a particular section of social media who don't like the mayor of London and who thought he'd said this, thought he'd said that he was going to move Armistice Day um, commemorations to commemorate um, uh, victims victims of war, um, he, he was going to move them to uh, accommodate a pro-Palestinian march that was happening around, this was just after the October the 7th attacks and, and the war kind of began unfolding in Gaza. Uh, and um, uh, it was, it, yeah, it was, it really, for me, was one of the first examples I've covered of where AI has succeeded in causing harm. Um, the other episodes uh, involve Premier League troll busters, so tracking down footballers' trolls and understanding um, uh, the impact and possibly the solutions to that. Um, I'm a big football fan, so that was particularly fun. And um, uh, and then also looking at misogyny and racism on X, and particularly this cycle that happens on X right now, that we used to call Twitter, um, where a high-profile account, a, an account with lots of followers, targets a particular person, often a, a woman, um, in this case a black woman, and triggers a whole wave of misogyny and abuse and racism directed at them. And the consequences of that cycle, which um, the, the woman in question, a pundit, Enia Luko, um, uh, believed is, is incentivized by X because the whole system right now means you can buy a blue tick, you can drive huge amounts of engagement by posting hate in this way. Um, X, who never respond to any of my requests for comment ever, except with an automated email reply, which says, we'll get back to you later, um, obviously didn't reply, but they would say that they continue to protect the user's voice. And I think we have a clip of Eddie to play. Yeah, let's do that. The next morning I get a call from the producer saying, are you okay? I said, what, what do you mean? I'm fine. And he said, there's a lot of stuff on social media about last night. I said, what do you mean? What happened? And he said, you know, Joey Barton has been, you know, uh, spouting off about you and, and Lucy. And he said something that we think is, is just horrific. So then I started to get quite um, 
anxious. What I don't understand is why people can't disagree without being racist or sexist or misogynistic. You can disagree with me, it's fine, but disagree intelligently. Disagree with the capacity to say, you're wrong because of this. I'm keen to find out firsthand what motivates these people to post these messages. One person behind an account does agree to speak to me. We're calling him James. What is it about women's football and female commentators in particular that has bothered you so much? Um, well, I, I just feel as if it, you know, it is a man's game. That's my opinion. You know, and speaking to other people, not just on Twitter, but other, and it's the same opinion that us men don't really want women in, involved in men's football. I don't feel threatened. I don't, you know, it's just an easy target, I suppose. Do you think it's different though, if you did have your real name mm -hmm. and you did have a real photo of yourself, mm -hmm. do you think you'd think more about what you post? Definitely, 100%. <laughs> Why? You're more accountable? You're more accountable for your, your not so much your, not your actions, for your comments. I've consistently realised that you can't have that level of hate without hating yourself, without being deeply unhappy without having something that makes you so angry that you have to get it out of your system. Keep proving that actually, no, we do belong in this space. Those are the things that I, I, I hope aren't as much of an issue for the next generation. So this is like emotional, difficult, heartfelt stuff. Like any there is telling a very personal story this cl it's clearly a kind of difficult story for her to tell. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about your kind of duty of care around uh, contributors and the people that you're, you're dealing with and kind of how you, how, you, how you work with contributors in this area. Yeah, um, I think it's so important, I mean, particularly when you're talking about issues like online hate, abuse, um, harassment online, that you absolutely prioritise um, protecting the people at its heart. And a lot of that is just doing good journalism, making sure that you are fair and accurate and that you represent them fairly um, and that you make sure they have consented in an informed way to what they're doing. Um, but so much of it is about the relationship you build with those people as well. So um, whether it was any or various other people who were kind of central to the cases I investigated for this series, you know, you speak to them so many times before before you even get the chance to interview them. And afterwards, you, you keep up that relationship. Um, and something I've really learned about this area, I mean, you know, Annie was a very good example of someone who, um, you know, has just recently had a really difficult experience. And so that was absolutely crucial. When I think of the young woman in Poland who was very vulnerable, who'd posted that she was Madeleine McCann, that was, again, incredibly important. And I don't think anyone realizes, you know, I'm up at midnight on a Saturday on the phone to, um, a woman who thought she was Madeleine McCann, making sure she's all right, making sure that, you know, the, the, the rela that relationship for me is incredibly important. Um, and I think it's really important as well that we're quite transparent with our audiences about, about the effort that we put in and the way that we protect people in that way. Um, one thing I've really learned is that the more of a hit, the more popular these kinds of series are, the more of a lightning rod people are for um, hate and trolling and abuse. And it, th that it kind of impresses upon you even more to ensure that. And with a series like this, what's been so brilliant about it is, obviously it's a podcast series and it, it's on BBC Sounds and it's for Radio 4, but it's also um, a series on iPlayer. It's a series of online articles. It's a series of social media clips, all of which racked up, I think it was more than 13 million views across all of the platforms and online. So this is reaching young and underserved audiences. It's been particularly been a hit with those people. Um, um, but all of that exposure for the contributors means that they also are likely to receive more hate and abuse, um, as well as support. And actually, what, one of my the things I'm happiest about with this series, other than the audience loving it, is that the people who are part of it have loved it and have been so happy with it and the outcome of speaking about it. And that's something I've found about social media harms in general. A lot of people feel like no one's listening to them. And so to be able to investigate their stories and speak about it, in some cases, they find really empowering and important. I think we have another question. If you could introduce yourself yeah. and say where yeah. you're from. You hear me? Hi, I'm um, Adele from Czech Radio. I have two questions actually from more institutional uh, side of the story. You're the first ever correspondent in that uh, role. Do you have a special protocol? You know, does the BBC have a special protocol for your safety protection or something like that? That's uh, question number one. 
And the second one, it's a big solo job for any woman or a man who's doing this. Uh, what's the way, how do you work with the editors and the BBC, you know, so they're aware of the dangers and of the matter? So I think the first question, we'll come to that in a moment, but I think let's do the... Okay, I'll start with the second do question. Do the Thank second you question, so much. Yeah. Um, the second question, what was it? Oh, yeah. Um, I, um, yeah, so, it, I mean, one of the most brilliant things about the BBC is being able to work really collaboratively with the different production teams and also the different editors. So when I do these podcasts, I'm working with Sam, who edits them, um, but I'm also working with... Um, brilliant producers who uh, you know are, are fantastic at crafting these stories and helping me and I really see it as a kind of team sport in that way that you know I'll do the journalism and the investigating and I really want to do that but there's no way I could have for example gone to meet the troll um, who was sending hate to Enia Luko on my own. You know, I was there with a team of four of us um, and we think so carefully about safety and how to protect ourselves and I'm a real believer in that we should basically apply the same investigative journalism principles we have for decades to this social media area um, and being able to go out and meet people face to face, not to kind of reside in an ivory tower and tell people what they think or don't think, but actually to go out and come face to face with people, both the people harmed and the people who are causing harm. Um, and I'd love to come face to face with the social media companies, but they don't like doing that very much. Um, I think that um, it's really important to be able to do that. And I could only do that kind of with the support of those teams. And then also, you know, those teams are so much part of the pulling it together, writing the scripts, us all working together to make it the best um, uh, podcast and series that it can be. Um, and I think that I'm really lucky to have that kind of level of resource to have those teams. But I think you want those kind of... I spend a lot of my time sort of navigating B the BBC systems by sort of slightly existing outside of them, um, which is to say that, you know, working with really brilliant but quite small and, and agile teams, I think is really crucial in this area um, and people who really get it and really care about it. Um, and um, I think that that's what's so brilliant about podcasts in particular, um, but also all of the kind of investigative projects I do. You're able to work with these kind of smaller and well-formed well teams. I actually think the kind of structure of where Mariana has ended up within the BBC is really interesting. And I think if you're, a, if you're a public service broadcaster and you're looking at this kind of role, I think you should, I mean, you should totally speak to Mariana and follow up. I think it is quite fascinating how that's ended up. Um, you've mentioned online abuse a few times. Do you know what I think has been the most interesting thing about this session that we've done is that the audience has laughed <laughs> uh, laughed as we've been as we've been watching these clips of these people essentially speaking mistruths and saying things that are that are not right. Um, you, you receive a heck of a lot of online abuse, right? Uh, how do you how do you deal with it? I think that actually doing doing my job is a huge part of dealing with it. Um, I see myself in some ways as a, as a case study here, and I think it's really important to investigate and interrogate what's happening to me, because that reveals a lot more about how this works, um, the way that hate can be weaponized and used as part of kind of conspiracy theory and disinformation movements on social media. It helps me to be able to connect with the people whose cases I'm investigating, because they speak to me because they feel like I get it, and I hope that I do get it, although often, you know, not to the extremes that, that these people have experienced it. They've often experienced some of the very worst things on social media, and I'm very lucky not to have had that. Um, so I think, yeah, seeing myself, you know, doing something, I hate, as you know, not doing stuff. I really like being able to, um, you know, take control of it and say, right, I'm going to investigate this. This is what's happening, and this is what it tells us. And I think increasingly, particularly in this kind of social media age, you have to have that relationship with the audience. You have to be transparent with them. You kind of can't just pretend this isn't happening. Actually, it's really important to say, look, this is happening. And actually, it confirms everything I've just exposed to you in this investigation. I'm now being targeted. A good example was with Enia Luko. Um, I was subsequently targeted by the, the same person who had triggered the waves of abuse at her um, on a series of occasions. And in some ways, I was really happy that I'd become the lightning rod for the hate rather than her. Um, it wasn't particularly fun, uh, but um, it, it just revealed, you know, it, it confirmed everything I'd just exposed. It said, yeah, look, this is how it works and this is what happens. Um, the hardest bit about the online abuse is the real world consequences, um, which is, 
you know, mirrors my job. It's like that is what my job is, kind of exposing the real world consequences. And that is that this spills offline. And I think it's important that people understand that the sheer volume of hate online, while the vast majority of people will never do anything and most of the threats are entirely empty, it normalizes a certain level of hate and abuse offline. And there have been a series of incidents um, which you've been party to at the BBC of people turning up outside the BBC, abusing me outside the BBC, um, uh, following me, um, targeting me with hate. And um, I think that a lot of these people say that freedom of expression is what they care about most. I think if you care about freedom of expression, targeting and abusing a young investigative reporter in a democracy outside her place of work doesn't quite seem like yeah. it's in line with the values of freedom of expression. And I think it's important that we call that out quite boldly, that we don't just accept it as kind of part and parcel of doing this stuff, because it's so common now, this kind of level of hate targeting journalists. I'm sure there are reporters in this room, journalists who've been targeted, um, targeting doctors, nurses, politicians, targeting people in the public eye, but also people out of the public eye. And so I think if m me talking about my own abuse and using it as a case study helps other people to be able to understand how this works, that is the positive I can take. Um, and one thing I said recently, which I think is true, I used to think that um, you shouldn't show any fear because showing fear would actually, um, uh, it's like, th these, you know, these people win. If you show that you're scared, then you're, they're ultimately succeeding in their goal. And I think that's true. Um, but actually, I think it's a certain element of fearlessness that totally spurs them on. They absolutely hate you not being scared and they absolutely hate you continuing to persevere. Um, and I think a lot about, you know, whether I should still be on X because I want to investigate social media, but it's really hard to exist on X with the level of hate and abuse I experience. Um, but you know, the day I leave there would be a bad day because I shouldn't not exist in those places. Um, so uh, to their great annoyance, I'll keep doing the journalism that I'm doing. Yeah, great. OK, so we've got a couple more minutes. I think we'll have a couple of questions. If you could introduce yourself, say where you're from, please. Thank you for this and uh, for your courage and for standing up for that. Because listening to the, your stories, my blood boils. So I really admire your approach and calmness and, and um, yeah. I'm uh, from Radio Skonto in Latvia and starting pandemic, we've learned to say more often, I can understand you, but I can't agree with you. What we have found that these people who uh, call us and write us with uh, hate, they stick with us, they keep listening. And then there comes a point where they need our help and they turn to us for that help or understanding. Still, still disagreeing with us, what is interesting. But uh, also listening to your stories, I have one question. Have you had a feeling that you could kill someone? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, just to kind of wrap with that question in mind. Yeah. Um, like, what is next in this space? You've been doing this job for a couple of years. Yeah. Is it? What, Mariana what? commits mass Ma murder? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not sure that's a catchy <laughs> podcast title. Um, I, uh, thank you so much for your question um, and for your lovely comments. Um, I, I think actually in some ways what you said, well, yeah, the first part of your question really kind of almost answers the second part, which is that I'm a big believer in empathy um, and I think that you can be both investigative and empathetic at the same time and I think that is absolutely crucial here it's one of the reasons why we did this why do you hate me series it's about understanding why people behave the way they do and looking to see whether forgiveness is possible whether resolution is possible what happens next um, and I think that we should increasingly apply that approach to this world obviously it's important to hold the people who are causing harm to account whether that's big rich social media companies or whether that's um, you know the someone who's set up their own conspiracy theory newspaper and is causing harm in some way. Um, but I think we should increasingly view the devoted followers of this movement as victims as well in some ways. Um, and not the same as the people who are really being targeted, but we have to make sure that we, um, that we try to understand why. And I, I often find the why is so much more interesting than the what. If you get Bogged down, we'd say. I feel like bogged down is a very British phrase. Mm. If you get if you get caught up in the um, in the what, you can end up just in this endless back and forth about well, this is a hoax and this is staged and did you read this and did you find this? Whereas actually, if you ask people why, what's the legitimate concern or 
the, the, the fear that led them to this point? Why are they so distrustful? Often they have had a really bad experience. In what way is their social media feed affecting them and the media they're consuming and how have they reached this point? I think all of that is far more revealing. And so I think uh, looking ahead to what is a massive election year, um, you know, we're planning another series of Why Do You Hate Me? Um, we're looking at things like the undercover voters. I run these undercover accounts um, for Americast, which is one of the BBC's other podcasts, and um, they allow me to interrogate what different people could be recommended or suggested on their feeds. We're planning to do something similar for the UK election. I think they're a key investigative tool um, you know, that doesn't deceive the audience, but allows you to really enter the social media spaces you otherwise wouldn't exist in. So all of that is very much on my agenda for the coming months. Um, but that I think really thinking about that kind of why and getting up close and empathizing and understanding, that is crucial. And I think that is part of the solution here. And I often say, you know, I'm not, I'm not a campaigner, I'm an investigative reporter. It's not my job to come up with the solution. That's lots of other people's jobs. Um, but it is my job to kind of expose what's going on. And I think increasingly our ability to talk about this and to try and understand and our willingness to understand is, is really part of a happy ending here, I hope, um, but not one that's probably coming for a while. A happy ending, what a place to end. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Mariana, and thanks to everyone here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great. And now it's lunch. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs>